All right. Okay. Well, I'm going to uh, I'm going to start off. Uh, welcome everybody on this uh, um, Tuesday evening on uh, March. We uh, we're excited to present to you the uh, on, through a virtual meeting, of course, following the protocols with COVID these days. Um, the waste management master plan update. Um, we have a uh, great participation right now. We've got approximately 65 individuals online with us here, comprised of residents from the city of Peterborough, uh, some residents from the county. We've got some of our uh, elected officials, councillors online as well from both within the city and within the county. Um, certainly our, the most valued, the, the residents of the community who are the stakeholders, who will be the individuals that will ultimately uh, live and breathe these programs. Um, we have some amazing consultants with us as well that we've engaged to assist us with this whole process. They've got a lot of experience, uh, not only here in Ontario, but across uh, Canada. So it's very exciting. Um, we recognize that everybody's very, very busy and you value your evening. So we thank you for joining us this evening. And we will certainly try to keep this uh, meeting between seven and nine to enable you all to at least spend a little bit of time with your family and, and such. Um, I guess a little bit of uh, housekeeping. Um, I, we're going to put everyone on mute while we are presenting some of the, the materials. And then there will be some online polls where we will request your feedback. Uh, and then we will be uh, uh, offering an opportunity for some dialogue as well with questions and answers. Uh, we are recording this session and we will be making this, all of this available um, through our um, municipal website um, and uh, uh, Connect Peterborough as well. Um, but uh, again, I thank you very much. And we are going to, I, I should add again, as, uh, as the manager of Waste Diversion, I have personally 30 years experience working in the environmental industry. I'm actually a graduate of Trent University from the, uh, the mid eighties. And um, I've been fortunate to spend my career working with municipalities um, across Canada, as well as working in municipalities, um, designing and implementing these various programs for recycling, for organics, um, all sorts of materials that, uh, that we'd like to keep at a landfill. So at this point, um, Alyssa, I guess I'm going to turn this over to our, our consultants. Um, perhaps if you would like to switch, uh, pr progress to the next slide. Uh, our team that we have hired, led by EXP Services, John Smith and John Louis Cadot. Uh, as well as uh, their, their team with Sherry Arcaro from REMM and Mike Barrett, who, uh, Mike, you were briefly speaking uh, a few minutes ago as well, and Alyssa Broadfoot, who's helping us with all of these online communications. Um, I am going to turn this over to our consultant experts to take it away, and thank you again for participating. All right, thank you very much, Dave, and uh, welcome everybody. Uh, nice to see such a good turnout uh, for our event this evening. My name is Sherry Arcaro, and I'm currently the VP of Consulting with REM Group. Um, I worked with the city and county of Peterborough for over 20 years in various waste management capacities as manager at the county. I operated the recycling facility, hazardous waste depot, waste electronics. And in the last past 12 years, because I have 32 years in this industry, where did the time go? Um, I've been assisting the city uh, on a lot of different uh, projects. It's, I'm very fortunate to get to live in, live in the backyard and get to help out on, uh, on various things and uh, a pleasure to be part of this uh, Waste Management Master Plan update. Uh, Alyssa, did you have any housekeeping before I jump into the slides? Yeah, I'll show you the that now. So everyone, my name is Alyssa. Um, if you're here before seven, you might have say a couple things. So I am here in the background just to make sure everything kind of goes smoothly. Um, there's always a few tech gremlins with Zoom, so we're trying our best. Um, but it's just a note how you can participate in the meeting. We've got a large group here, and 
of them. That's why we're asking that you keep your cameras off and your microphones muted for now. Uh, I think we'll, we'll get to questions at the end. Um, during the presentation, we have a couple where we're going to be asking a poll question, and you'll get an opportunity to ask one of the many options. Um, and if you have a question, as we go through the presentation and at the end of something, we just that you raise your hand. So now you can you see down at the bottom of your screen uh, reactions. And if you hover over that or click on it, you'll see all those icons with that raise hand. So it just, I just want to practice that for a second, try to find that button, or, or at least go look for it. If you raise your hand right now and put it back down, just so you know where it is. There you go. One, I'm sure we'll get a few more here. Excellent. Thumbs up. Um, the polls just asked in the chat, how do I poll? We're going to get to that. I'll show you in just a second. The other option for communicating with us is the chat box. So if you, on the bottom of the screen, click chat, it will open up a box and you can post messages. Um, so if you do have a question that you don't want to interrupt, just type it there and we'll get to it at the end. I know my odd is having some issues tonight. The internet connection is crazy. I like it to be so. I might switch um, to my to another option as Sherry's presenting. Uh, one last thing after this night, we're hosting a recording and um, you're right, and you'll have the opportunity to submit feedback via a uh, feedback form or by email or voicemail. So we'll keep that up just so you know there will be an opportunity for everyone to get their voice heard. And that, I'll turn to Sherry. Excellent. Thanks, Alyssa. Yes, it's it's interesting this new world that we're in and with a lot of people running their uh, you know running Netflix and Apple TV, et cetera, the evenings, the bandwidth tends to get a little dicey in some rural areas. All right, so yeah. um, if, oh, did you want to do the first poll, sorry? Yeah, let's start with the physical question. So I'm just going to launch a poll. You should see it pop up in front of this slide. And so the question is, how did you hear about tonight's meeting? And if you guys don't mind, just select that you can choose. I will try the question. And this will help us understand our meeting and so we can promote them for next time. So just let it go for five more seconds. Close it. All right. Thanks everyone. Okay, so we've got those results. Um and we'll carry on. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. So our Outline for our meeting tonight or our presentation tonight is to go over the project purpose, our progress since 2012, which was when the last update of the waste management master plan was done, the current programs in the city, um, a little bit more about maximizing the three R's, reduce, reuse, and recycle, which are obviously the cornerstone of uh, the discussion this evening. And then there'll be a, a chance for you to pose some questions through the chat, uh, through the chat box, and then we'll speak a little bit more about next steps. So on to the first slide. The purpose of this uh, project. So looking at the 2012, um, it was decided that it was time. It was time for an update. It was set that it was going to be, you know, a 10 year uh, update. And then at that point it would uh, be revised. So we're looking to modernize the waste management master plan to meet the evolving needs of the residents of Peterborough. This is being done by looking at waste management best practices in other communities and tailoring them for a made in Peterborough plan to help reduce waste and increase diversion. As we know, they come hand in hand. And, and just like they did back in 2012, that's still the priority, you know, maximizing diversion and, and, and minimizing actual waste generation. So this is being done to put the city in a, in a better position for when the blue box program transitions uh, in a couple of years uh, to the producer responsibility. And as the Ministry of the Environment and Climate Change um, starts looking at food waste and organics policy uh, that they want to uh, put forth. On to the next slide. So looking back, what's, uh, oh, sorry, Alyssa, <laughs> I'm 
<laughs> and next slide. Our progress since the 2012 uh, Waste Management Master Plan update. So here we go. This is the uh, progress that has been made, and it's been fantastic. You know, we're looking back at what we've accomplished. Uh, the city and its residents have done a lot. Here are the targets, the different goals that were set at that time. Um, and you know, we've we've done a lot. A lot has been um, accomplished. Uh, over the years, we're still working on that, um, increasing the residential diversion rate to 75% over 20 years. We're only 10 years into it, and we'll speak to that uh, further in, into the uh, presentation. And the implement um, implementation of source separated organics collection and um, processing is in the works. So this is, this is great. We're all check marks, and the other two are work in progress, but we're still meeting uh, the timelines that were uh, proposed in that uh, master plan update. On to the next slide. Nope, did I lose Alyssa? Thank you. <laughs> so we'd be remiss going any further into this presentation without talking about the fact that our waste stream is evolving. Uh, I think everybody knows technology and, and our waste stream has changed a lot. Over the past 10 years, there's been major advancements in technology and the right-hand picture is a serious depiction of that. Um, you know, there's 73% less newsprint and magazines in the waste stream, uh, and that's due to computers, tablets, and phones being used as a method of, of getting our news. You know, we don't just have to watch it on TV or read it in a paper anymore. Magazines, a lot of people, you know, their subscriptions uh, electronic now. So that has really changed. And the magazines and newspapers were a huge weight in the system. When I started back in 91, now I'm dating myself. Um, that was, you know, the primary material coming into the Peterborough Recycling Facility was newsprint magazines and printed paper. Uh, so it's changed a lot. Um, watching it's been quite incredible. You know, the, the screen size of your television has likely doubled in size. I don't know about you folks, but every few years when sadly the TVs don't last anymore, my husband goes bigger and bigger every time. Um, that said, the weight of it goes down. I think I carried the last one into the house. Certainly couldn't have done that with the uh, console version there. Um, packaging on the other end has gotten incredibly lighter too. Um, the producers for many reasons, uh, for uh, improve their carbon footprint, reduce their costs, reduce the amount of material they're using, uh, reduce freight um, by weight. They've, they've changed from whether it's gone from glass to plastic, steel to, you know, like the dole one, a PET container, or even in the case of the water bottle, they've, they've actually taken what was originally, you know, the first uh, PET water bottle, and they've managed to reduce the amount of PET plastic being used in it by about 30%. I know some people, it's you grab the bottle, and if you give it too much of a grab, you can almost, uh, squish it in half there, but um, it, it is a serious reduction in the amount of um, materials used, which which is positive. That's the whole thing we're supposed to be reducing as well as, you know, diverting. So these are positive things, but we're, I wanted to bring this point up because we need to understand that we the, the weight of material going through our waste stream has changed. Things have gotten lighter. So while we use weight as the measurement for um, determining our success and our diversion, we need to take these things into account. The other point to the slide is we need to take into account that these things have changed. The system has changed. The equipment required to manage everything and, and how we deal with it has changed. So overall, the amount of blue box material available for diversion um, has decreased by 29% uh, over the past 10 years by weight. 29% by weight. The volume's gone up, but the weight has gone down. So these are important factors as we start to talk a little bit about the numbers and the data um, that we're gonna get into next. Next slide, please, Alyssa. All right, so what does this mean for, you know, to Peter, the Peterborough program and our waste generation rates? Well, our increase, in waste diverted from landfill has gone up by uh, one by less than 1% by weight, right? So that's the left-hand column. As I said, all these materials have gotten lighter. So you can look at this and say, oh, geez, we just haven't diverted very much more. Actually, by volume, it's gone up exponentially. You know, like I say, uh, PET bottle, it's, you know, it, it's dropped 
30% by weight. So it takes more of those to make up that same weight. So we are doing an excellent job. The actual weight of the material has gone down, but we are dealing with more pieces, if that makes sense. The garbage we're generating has also gone down. That's fantastic. And this is with a 7.5% increase in population in the city. So that's terrific. Part of it is because of the materials themselves getting lighter, back to that television example I gave you. Um, but it's also because people are diverting more and the programs are a success. And so just again, to reiterate, the industry norm is to measure waste by weight. When, it, when the lighter materials, you know, it, it requires more effort to divert more by weight when the materials are lighter. So, you know, it's really important to remember this and the residents of Peterborough should be very proud with their reduction, reuse and recycle efforts. And, and I think these graphs are indicative of that. Next slide, we have a poll. Alyssa, are you good? Yes, you'll all have to tell me if my audio is better now. Um, okay, we're launching a poll based on your own experience. Do you think we're doing enough to achieve our goals? This is us at the curb, us as the city, uh, the collective we. What do you think? I'll give you um, give you 20 more seconds. Audio improved, yay! <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, five more seconds. Okay, ending the pool, and I will show you guys the results of this one. So, most people think we could be doing more, and some, six out of 34, think we're doing just the right amount. Goldilocks. Okay, back <laughs> to you, Sherry. Alyssa, can I jump in for a second? We didn't actually see the results of your first doodle. And I were wondering, I know we're all curious to know how that one was. Do you have okay. those results? Let me see. Um, let's go back to the old one, share the results. Okay. Um, Facebook, newspaper, city website, and a few others. So I think in our um, survey after this meeting is over, we're asking that question again. So we'd love to hear what those others meant. Okay. Thanks, Alyssa. Okay, no on next. All right, so next we're gonna talk about the current programs. Next slide. So there's a lot of information on these next two slides. So um, I'll try to speak a little slower. I know I do speak rather quickly, um, but in 2020, the city of Peterborough residents generated approximately 35,000, a little over 35,000 tons of waste. 53% of that was diverted from landfill. The two biggest diversion programs right now are the Blue Box Recycling Program for printed paper and packaging and the Leaf and Yard Waste Program. Those two alone make up 38% of the current waste diverted. There, that leaves another 15% which is made up of several smaller, but equally as important programs. Well, thank you. Okay, so here's how we break down that 15%. As you can see, you know, you've got the C&D waste and hazardous waste, electronics, et cetera. Um, all these programs are very important and they not only reduce waste from landfill, but they also have a very positive impact on the environment. You know, household hazardous waste, electronics and tires, technically by weight only equate to 3.6% of the diversion in Peterborough, but their diversion from landfill and their recycling at the end use, you know, it holds a much higher weight when it comes to the health and safety of our environment. And I think that's really important to note. Our reduction and diversion efforts are something to be very proud of. And we're amongst the 15th percentile of municipalities in Ontario for our efforts. And with all these excellent programs in place, you know, how do we reduce and divert even more from our landfill? That's, that's the question. Well, we need to develop a modernized plan uh, that is a made in Peterborough solution. And I'm gonna say that again, because I've lived here my whole life, since I was five, uh, pretty much my whole life. And Peterborough is unique. We're very unique and our residents are very passionate, which is why I ended up in this industry and why I never left. It's why I love this industry so much is because I've dealt with Peterborough residents all this time. So we need a solution where we can maximize the three R's, reduce, reuse, and recycling. You all know those. Um, with this constantly evolving waste stream that I was explaining a little bit earlier, 
it adds challenges and we need to modernize our plan to be able to meet those needs. Next slide. Sherry, I'll just jump in yep. and trivia uh, just for, for all of our participants. The household hazardous waste facility that we have on Pido Road, we average about 21,000 visitors a year to that facility when it's open between Wednesdays and Saturdays. So it's very, very, very well received. Excuse me just a second here. I just blew myself right off the screen. Hang on. Sorry. Um, can you hear me? <gasps> we can oh, hear no. you, Sherry. Okay. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> There's a bit of panic there. Sorry about yeah. that, folks. I have lost my Zoom just a sec. I knew there'd be something crazy. There, here we go. Phew. I have two screens going. Two screens can be too much. All right. <laughs> Maximizing the three hearts. <laughs> she panics. Okay. Next slide, please, Alyssa. And just before you jump ahead, sorry, one thing we did not add in there um, were mattresses. And we just noticed, and, and we actually divert on average 13,000 mattresses a year within the city of Peterborough as well. So thank you, Virginia. And that, that's an amazing number. Uh, that program's fantastic. All right, so in working on the update and the modernization of this uh, Waste Management Master Plan, the team has looked at several um, different, you know, different best practices that are used across Ontario, Canada, and North America to help increase waste diversion from landfill. Um, the first one of which would be the source separator organics plan. Uh, it's the it's already you know the pro the process is already underway with looking to launch in the fall of uh, 2023, and um, we're anticipating that there will be an increase in diversion of conservatively 15 to 20 percent, um, which is fantastic. That's absolutely going to help getting us towards that goal of 75 percent in 20 years that was set previously and that will be um, uh, re-upped in the new modernized plan. Another one, if we can move to the next slide, please, Alyssa is looking at, so social effort organics will give us that significant increase in diversion. However, to get to that 75%, there's a few other best practices that we're talking about in this study and that we're looking at that will complement what's already being done. Uh, one such one is the use of clear bags for garbage. Uh, it has been proven in other municipalities that the use of clear bags increases the proper disposal of recyclables, household hazardous waste, electronics, and the other materials that already have diversion alternatives from landfill. Uh, additional benefits to clear bag uh, also is increased safety for collection workers, um, which is which is really important, um, and the ability to develop focused education campaigns based on the contamination that can be seen uh, in in the garbage stream. So many municipalities across Ontario and Canada are already have already implemented clear bags and had uh, fantastic success. So that's one of the alternatives that they're looking at for uh, increasing diversion. Next slide. Another best practice being considered is a modified collection, collection frequency. And by this we mean uh, providing weekly collection for materials that can be diverted from landfill. So you're recycling organics and yard waste and then bi-weekly collection for garbage. When a municipality has a comprehensive recycling program, uh, and organic selection program. The remaining garbage that's destined for landfill is, is minimal um, and it no longer has the bulky materials such as packaging uh, or the smelly stuff uh, that comes from the food waste. So this only leaves a small amount of garbage uh, that needs to be collected on that bi-weekly bi schedule. Uh, so that's the benefit to that. Then moving on to the next one. So to further round out the diversion and hit that 75% uh, proposed target, the city's looking to enhance other waste diversion programs, such as uh, supporting and promoting take back and recycling um, producer run ones. So return to retail, mail back programs, et cetera. And we all know the city has a fantastic calendar that I know is extremely popular. Um, one for the artwork in it um, and, and two for the content and, and 
it's very helpful for residents and more information on that kind of thing can be found and will be found in the calendar and promoted. Expanding on other opportunities, they'd be looking at, you know, carpet and textile recycling, increasing that. Uh, there's already a bin at uh, Pido Road for textile recycling. That's an excellent program that Dave uh, has put in, in his team last year. And also looking at increased reuse for furniture, appliances, and other large items, to name a few. So if you have suggestions on other things that the city can do to enhance diversion, uh, other things that can be added, when you complete the online feedback form, we want to hear about it. And Alyssa will speak a, a little bit about more of that, that feedback form shortly. But we want to hear about it. Uh, we're open to your ideas. That's the point of this um, modernization of an update of this uh, master plan is to look at all the different ways that we can increase this diversion. Next slide. So there's been a lot of information in these previous slides. I've gone over it fairly quickly, um, but a lot of information on what's been accomplished in Peterborough and some high level information on how we propose to take that 2012 waste management master plan um, or accomplish the date and, and how we can modernize to meet the uh, needs of the growing population, which we said, well, we're already at 7.5% and I'm sure that's going to increase even more. Um, and the evolving waste stream, which we can't forget. Things are changing. We have to change with it so that we can continue to divert more than we're currently diverting. So to wrap up this uh, segment of the presentation, um, here's a slide that'll show you what we're achieving now on the top band. You saw that earlier. And, and what we're projecting as a diversion rate, if we all work together, all city residents and the city on their programs work together to implement um, these proposed programs are what end up becoming the recommendations in the two plan to discuss tonight. And with that, I will turn it over um, to Alyssa. Okay, we've got quite a few good questions in the chat. So maybe we'll start there. And if anyone wants to ask a question, um, verbally just raise your hand and um i'll let you know uh when we're coming to you okay so again just a reminder that the along the bottom bar you got your chat and your reactions where you can raise your hand um dave there was a couple questions on green bin should i direct these to you just scroll up sure and what i'm going to do just to make sure i maintain my connection i'm going to turn off my video because it's it's it is very sporadic so uh i'm okay. here and yes i certainly will take a stab and if anyone else wants to uh, join in from uh, from within our team within the city or within the consultants absolutely but i i can certainly leave that off thank you okay um the first one i'm seeing here is was peterborough the recipient of green bin funding in 2018 yes the city received a um um, a grant from the federal government, Climate Action, and to the tune of approximately $7 million, um, which is, a, is substantial support towards the city being able to proceed with this initiative. And since that date, what we've been doing, we've been very, very uh, involved with, uh, again, the studies, the background studies that go into this, the siting of the location and any impact assessments. Uh, there's, there's interaction with the local townships and the county and zoning. There is a selection of the technology to be implemented. Um, and then of course, uh, once all of the approvals are in place, there is a construction. So someone might uh, think that, wow, this is quite a, quite a lag time between uh, receiving the funds and implementing a program, but certainly it, it does take time um, to proceed and, and we are proceeding as quickly as we can. And it is similar to other community experiences with similar programs. Okay, and then next question was, will the separated organics be for residential, restaurants, commercial, and condos? The city collection program, we will be targeting the single family residents within the city as well as, well as the multi-res buildings that, that we um, um, service. Uh, as far as the ability for the um, uh, 
the ICNI sector, the commercial establishments, the, the industrial establishments, um, by all means, they would work for the private hauler. They're going to have a lot larger tonnage, and, and we, can, we will certainly um, accommodate the, uh, the inclusion of that feedstock as well. As well as outside of the city of Peterborough, we, we're building with, with the, the hopes and that uh, the surrounding townships uh, within the county of Peterborough would be interested in participating as well. Okay, just to mix things up, let's go to Rodney next. And Rodney, you've got your hand up. If you just want to unmute yourself. Maybe I got to... Yeah, um, I have a question. If you run out of the black garbage bags uh, for your uh, apartment or your house, and if you want to use uh, um, clear uh, bags, like recycling bags, and use it as garbage bags or whatever, is the city going to take that? Because I live in an apartment building, and I noticed a lot of people here are using garbage bags as recycling, and uh, my super looks at me like, what are you using large bags for? It's like, because I try to do at least of more than a couple days garbage then uh, once, once it starts smelling, then I get rid of the garbage. But I mean, just uh, use a, about half bag of garbage that's non-stinking, you know? Um, and then yeah, like I keyed in earlier, I only use the clear plastic bags for recycling. But um, I've noticed that um, with the city of Peterborough, our drivers here, a um, couple of times uh, employment plan counseling, Peterborough, they have about five to six bags of recycling stuff shredded and then this uh ash burnham realty on uh hunter street and um what's the other intersection there water street i noticed they have about eight or nine bags of shredded stuff they take them so i need to find out if it's best for me when i'm in an apartment because i shred stuff for confidentiality when i use the clear bags is it best for me to put those clear bags in the recycling bin uh tied up or is it better for me just to pour those shredded papers into the recycling bin because I've had arguments with the super and I said, I'll find out which is the best to go with and uh, so on. Thank you, Rodney. A lot to unpack there. So I'll, I'll try to see if I've captured all of your questions. First of all, with regards to the clear bag garbage, yes, the intent would be the utilization of the larger uh, clear bag similar size to a standard garbage bag for containing that material. Um, in apartment buildings, recognizing of course there's the chutes and they're, they're smaller, there are the smaller size clear bags, say 20 by 22, where a larger might be 38 by, by 40. Um, the ability to include what we call a privacy bag, which would be a smaller, opaque, dark, maybe it's a grocery bag, maybe it's a, it's a kitchen catcher, it's opaque, but the ability to include an opaque, small privacy bag will also be included because we recognize there will be situations where there may be materials that, that individuals really don't want uh, to be seen. And that's fine, we respect that. Um, with regards to your shredded paper, yes, our existing program does allow both for the single family residents as well as the multi-res for shredded paper to be included in a clear bag tied. We don't want that uh, material spilling out, um, whether it's at the collection point, in the truck or in the in the MRF before it's processed. So tied, we do allow as well clear bags for loose flying type paper, anything loose on the paper side that could uh, could blow out of the box. So that would uh, would continue as well. And that paper, I would encourage you to continue to direct your shredded paper in a clear bag to the recycling stream. Okay, so put the re clear recycling bags in with the into the bins as well and also make sure that they're tightened so nothing comes out of them or loose uh loose well dust. when it's shredded paper when it's the small shred like confetti you want to tie that because you that that's just going to spill everywhere if it's uh items such as like a an envelope um uh, office paper, anything that could be picked up and blown. We ask that that be left open uh, in, in the clear bag. The reason being is when this material is collected, first of all, the truck is a two chambered truck. That's why we ask people to put all their fiber items in one blue box and all their container items in the other. And as much as it may look 
from within a household that all this material is going into the same chamber in the truck. It's actually going in into a, a hopper divided in two. And then when the material gets to the facility, the collector will, um, will go to one drop off location and open half the truck, dump those contents, say the fiber in that area, and then go to the other area and dump the uh, container items because they're going up um, our line, our, our processing line, heavily automated at different times with different intent for the material. Um, so we, we, we really require that that be segregated into the appropriate stream. Okay, because the city of Peterborough itself uh, replied to me one day, says, hi Rodney, please uh, loosely tie, uh, tie the recycling ban uh, bags so they don't uh, pull all over the place. But then I'm like, that makes no sense. I might as well tie it into a knot and then like into one knot and then whatever. And then also, um, the other thing is, is I noticed our recycling bins here in the apartment building get over full. And sometimes I'll put cardboard boxes in a recycling bag. Sometimes I'll put cans in the clear recycling bag and uh, like plastics and cans in one bag. Um, is that acceptable or should I uh, dump those clear bags into the blue bin uh, once I get downstairs? Like I, I, uh, once the material is dumped in the recycle, in the in the it's called a material recovery facility. A MRF is the acronym. Um, we do not have an automated debagger system to extract the contents from the bags. We've looked as of many municipalities across North America, and to date, they wrestle with quote the silver bullet to really extract the contents appropriately. So on the container side we ask that none of those items be in bags because when it's dumped and it's going up the line, it's going under magnets, it's going, um, we have an eddy current to, to flip the aluminum. And then we have optic eyes that will determine what type of plastic it is and, and use air streams to-, to No, you missed, I think you misunderstood my point. What I'm saying is, is when I live in an apartment building, I'm, I'm single. So if I buy plastic bag, my, um, drinking bottles or uh, cans or glass or whatever. Well, I wouldn't do it to glass because I would be afraid of it breaking. But if I want to put uh, cardboard in a clear bag, rip it up and then into pieces and then whatever, because I know CMHJ did that one day. They had one bag of cans uh, and plastic and then another bag of uh, some other stuff. So I know some businesses are getting accepted, but the residential, I don't know what the procedure is. If I should just... Uh, get a blue box, a personal blue box, and then put them in there and then sort them and then put them into our, our apartment building's uh, recycling box, or I mean, the bins or what? Okay, I would, I would from your apartment unit, you can certainly carry the those container items down to your central area where those larger uh, the bins are for curbside pickup, but then I would actually ask that you then would just simply dump that material from the bags into those, um, into those larger bins. As far as your cardboard, certainly we, re we require that cardboard be flattened simply because it's so voluminous when, it, when, it, when it's the full box. Um, and if you can fit that into the container, or sorry, pardon me, the, the fiber side uh, bin, so be it. Ideally, if you can simply bail, um, wrap it into a small bale and just set it uh, beside the container, that helps as well. Okay, so basically you're asking us not to uh, put cans of plastic in one, in one bag and then when it gets full, tie it up and then uh, leave it the way it is uh, for recycling. Right. In your unit, uh, if you need to fill that plastic bag to take it down to your uh, centralized area to transport it, um, fine. But please, when you get down to that area, just simply dump those contents out of the bag. Well, that's what I do once the, re if the recycling bags, empty, I mean, the recycling containers are empty, but once it gets full, there's no room to put them in. So that's why a couple of times I've just filled the bag and then take the bag down there and left it there. Yeah, we, we do work closely with the buildings and our staff work with the buildings to try to accommodate the, the number of containers that they require for the collections so that there, there isn't the overflow, but there are obviously sometimes there could be challenges and seasonally and with holidays and such too. So um, I we do offer the depot as well, where residents can take the material 24 seven to the recycling depot that, that uh, handles all of the curbside material as well as these 
other materials that uh, Sherry was alluding to. Uh, yeah. But, and Rodney, we'd certainly, uh, you know, we can take this offline uh, and certainly be happy to uh, have our staff uh, talk to you further. And we have guidebooks and we have information that's available online, screening cards that might help you as well. Yeah, I would appreciate it because I get so flustered with my super. He's like, who's putting all this stuff in the bags and leaving them? I'm like, I am because sometimes uh, recycling bins are over flooded and so on. And, uh, Okay, thank you. Sorry, Mark, I didn't mean to hold up the time. It's okay, Rodney. Um, we'll go, we'll, I'll go read a question from the chat now about clear bags. Um, so I'm not sure if this should be for Dave or Sherry, jump in. Do clear bags, clear plastic bags, have a lower impact on the environment than black bags as far as production, reuse opportunities, waste diversion? I can jump in, Sherry, to start. Um, bags, clear bags are typically made out of LDP plastic, low density polyethylene plastic. And whether it's a black opaque bag or a clear bag, it's LDP. The only difference being is on the dark bags or the green bags or the blue bags, there's, there's dye that's injected. The resin to begin with is clear. Um, so they just add it. Where the benefit comes in is when you see this incremental diversion of all material from landfill. Uh, when you're, I'll use, I'll refer to the city of Markham, which is probably one of the leaders in Ontario, if not Canada. And they have a clear bag program. They have all these other programs that we've been talking about too. And their diversion rate is over 82%. So the intent is if we can drive all of these other materials out of the waste stream, we have an overall uh, higher environmental success story. Okay. Um, I'm going to read a couple more and then we'll go to, to John with his hand up. We'll just get through a couple more in the chat because you see there's a lot. Um, where do textiles actually go? Uh, our, our partnership that the city has, we presently have a, a textile bin at the um, at the, at the recycling facility and one at the landfill. We have a, a partnership with Diabetes Canada. So they are the recipient of all of our textiles. Okay. Um, okay, I know Dave that you had touched on this briefly, but we'll just ask it as a um, direct question. What are the privacy considerations slash allowance for a privacy bag for switching to clear bags? Yeah, that, and you know, we recognize that time and time again is, is one of the first questions people ask. Is, well, I, I wonder about privacy. We recognize that. And as I mentioned earlier, what we have the allowance for a small privacy bag or, or a couple of privacy bags within the, uh, the larger clear bag is certainly something that um, we would look to incorporate in the program. Okay. Um, John, let's go to you now. No, I should, I should mention too, from, and I've got experience in, in the clear bag uh, world since about 1991 with Halifax. And um, um, a lot of people that implement it say that at the, at the end of the experience is that it's like ripping off a Band-Aid. The anticipation is much worse than the reality. When these programs are, are implemented, they're really just a matter of fact. Okay. Good okay, evening, John. Dave. I'll keep it brief. Um, two things. First of all, if you're going to make, I, probably the greatest diversion you can do would be to bring in the organic, you know, the, the green bins. Um, when they come in, I think that'll, you'll see a major drop in uh, the items that are in the garbage bag for starters. The other thing is a suggestion. If you're going to make the switch over to the clear bags, realize that people may have a a whole whack of the black bags around. Uh, a suggestion would be to bring it in over, let's say a two year period, so that people can get rid of the bags that they currently have and get used to the idea of switching over to the clear bags. And, and uh, I think you'll find a whole lot less resistance to it than I know that in some areas outside of Peterborough that tried to bring it in and it was met with uh, a fair bit of pushback. So that's, it's just an idea that if you're going to bring it in, allow it to phase in slowly so that it might gain acceptance and people can get rid of the bags that they, they currently have and, and make the switch over to the clear bags. 
John, thank you. That's an excellent point. And you're absolutely right. There are a handful of, of key issues that you want to address. And one of them is absolutely lead time notification because, and again, from experience in other communities, it's amazing how many people have gone to Costco and bought a hundred count uh, box of bags uh, or, or maybe even more. And they have these on hand. So the intent would be to provide ideally up to a year's notice before that input, that program is implemented to allow people to, um, to recognize that and not, um, and, and not stock up on, on the black bags. And another thing we have to watch for as we get closer to a launch date, a lot of local retailers might start putting their opaque bags on sale. Uh, say a month before the uh, the transition, just to get rid of them. So we want to make sure that our residents are well aware that just because you walk into a retailer and you see um, half price on on opaque bags, fairly close to a transition date, you do not want to be buying those. So we also work engage very closely with retailers to one make sure they alter what's called the planogram in stores, the listings of the materials, the facing of the materials, facing of clear bags, and, uh, and transition out of their, their opaque bags accordingly. They are getting better. There's over a million houses across Canada that are presently participating in such programs. So there's a lot of uh, retail experience, especially with the big chains. And then when we approach them about a year in advance, they know how to put the, the wheels in motion for the transition. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, that was a great question. Okay, um, I'm gonna kind of mush a few questions together, Dave, and seeing a few different people are asking about energy from waste or incineration or um, the SSO as a feedstock for renewable energy generation. Do you wanna just talk about that generally? I guess at a very high level. So our target, our goal is, is a 75% plus diversion from landfill. So there will be the, the, the remaining material, the residue, uh, until other programs come along or until there's other packaging designs, et cetera, that eliminate that too. So, so that material has to be addressed. Th that is really going to be under a separate process um, through our landfill. Our landfill has approximately 13 years of capacity left at this point in time. And at about the 10-year uh, point, the city will be looking at uh, the, the options going forward for um, the evolution of, of that world and where, where the waste is going to go. So I can't, I, I can't really, um, I, the intent is not to speak to EFW as a uh, energy from waste as a, as a solution here. It's really to say the focus is let's get to this 75% diversion and, and decrease the size of snowball that we're dealing with to begin with. Oh, the question also was with regards to um, on the SSO side, the residue, the, the screenings, we'll call it on the organic side. So certainly our focus is to not include plastic in our SSO, the source separate organic stream, uh, to minimize, to help minimize the amount of, of, of uh, con discards, contamination that we get. A lot of the material that would be oversized wood and bark will, as we trommel it, we will continue to pull, we call it the overs pile, and that, that will be re-injected back into the, the organics processing to ideally break that material down. I hope that helped answer the question. Okay, um, I'll read one more out and then we'll go to Edgar after that. So a uh, question for Sherry, where do the plastics in the blue box actually end up? Okay, well, this is a fun one because this is what I've been spending the past 12 years uh, playing in a little more on this side of the world. So once the plastics are collected at the material recycling facility or recovery facility, depending on how you phrase it, the MRF, they are separated into different resin types. So you've got your PET, like your pop bottles, your HDPE, which is generally your uh, shampoo bottles, detergent bottles, um, polypropylene, which is you know, margarine tubs and that type of material. Those are separated, those are bailed, and then those are shipped off to different commodity markets. At those end markets or reprocessors, as we call them, they then break the bales open, they resort it to ensure that it's a nice clean stream, and then they shred it, wash it, and repelletize it. 
um, some of these facilities make it into new products. Uh, a good example of that would be some of the, uh, well, the Blue Planet furniture and um, shelving, et cetera, that you've seen at Canadian Tire that is made out of blue box material from Ontario. Um, water bottles, same thing. The PET plastic is taken, shredded, cleaned, resorted to get any contaminants out. And then it is uh, flaked in that case, made into um, new water bottles that are made out of 100% post-consumer plastic. In an Ontario, about 80% of the plastic water, um, PET plastic bottles, so your pop bottles and water bottles, go to one particular facility where they are uh, reprocessed and, and made back into 100% recycled content water bottles. And it's really exciting because the bales of recycling are picked up on the truck um, that has just dropped off water bottles to a retailer down the street. So it's a complete closed loop system. Um, there's a question in here um, that spoke to, are we just moving stuff from diverting from one landfill to another? And I suspect um, that that was related to um, when there's yield loss and or contamination that leaves in these bales of recycling. So absolutely, when a bale of recycling leaves the Murph on Pido Road, it is not 100% pop bottles. It's not 100% anything. There is some contamination in there. When it goes to a reprocessor, it's broken open. As I said, it's washed. It's either flaked, uh, ground up, flaked, palletized, cleaned. And sometimes there are other containers in there. Um, depending on the facility, if it's valuable, um, I'll go back to the example of the water bottle facility that I'm talking about. They literally have a magnet, they pull off steel, they pull off aluminum, and they pull off other plastics that they send to their sister facility that makes plastic furniture. So there are some fantastic facilities, reprocessors that are closed loop systems. They work hard to be zero waste. So they take all the yield loss and or the contamination that comes in and they find a home for it. Um, but definitely there, there is yield loss in, in reprocessing. And for the most part, the answer to that is those go to energy. Um, most of the reprocessors that we deal with, because the company I work for has a marketing arm that that's what we do is we buy and, um, and sell uh, recyclables from across Canada and North America. And those facilities do generally the um, yield loss or anything that's contamination. If it is not reused, at another facility or reshipped to say aluminum facility, it goes uh, for energy. So, um, and I think that uh, da, 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 da. there was one other question that was similar to that. Um, but, oh, oh I can, I'll just quick address if it's okay, Alyssa, the one on um, yeah. plastics being better labeled for disposing and recycling. The issue with, with, the labeling on containers is when the brand owners are doing the labeling, they're quite often doing it for US, Canada, or all of North America. So to label it specifically, it's not going to work because unfortunately not every program is the same in every state or every province. So that's where we depend on municipalities like the city of Peterborough to have their fantastic website and their, you know, and, and waste wizards and things like that, where you type in, what do I do with my water bottle? What do I do with my plastic shovel? <laughs> um, which of course would be landfill. But that's what we, we count on those for because unfortunately with all the packaging, the brand owners can't label it by province. It's just not, not gonna work. Um, you're, we're always going to rely on municipalities to provide that education um, or, or you know, provincial education on that. And then I'll throw it over and see if there was other ones you can throw to Dave. Um. Yeah, let's go to Edgar now. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> this meeting is very much appreciated opportunity for us to express our waste management views to an interested group of professionals. And we thank Sherry for giving us a good story on the nuts and bolts associated with the current operation at Bensford. Now, if you'd like comments of the comments that I may make a little later, you may ask Henry Clark, Councillor Henry Clark, he can give you the mailing address for me, right? First of all, mass waste management technology is an extensive and a broad technology applied widely over our planet. 
reviewing and upgrading a master plan such as this must be carefully planned and must focus on just a few of the, of the available technologies that currently are being used on international projects. The current waste mass management master plan review needs to focus on energy from waste, recovering the energy that's co contained in the waste. And that's represented clearly by the energy from waste technology, which is described as mass burn. Plasma arc and gasification do not qualify. And I will tell you why. We should not at any time waste any of our time and money looking at these, this, these technologies. Recently, Kavanta Power established a research project to compare gasification to mass burn in the southern United States. They installed the gasification technology in one of their mass burn plants, and they were looking for comparisons in cost and performance. What they found was that the furnaces and the emission control equipment in the plants were equivalent, but the pre-furnacing pre or fern free, shall we say, uh, conversion of the mass of, a, of the garbage to the plants required very, very high and costly preconditioning. So much so that the, uh, the this particular correspondence or this particular type of uh, of conversion was not considered. And at the end, Kavana concluded that the cost and performance comparison of the furnaces were okay, but the preconditioning made the, the concept unacceptable. Currently, Kavanta is building four new energy for waste plants in Southern England. All four plants use mass burn technology, that's energy from waste, and are replacing old gasification facilities. So gasification should not be considered as a candidate for the study being proposed here. And we do have to lift the study out of the daily operation of Bensport into the future. Now, the, uh, the, the other thing is plasma arc. And you will know that this was subject to an extensive research project in Ottawa by the plasma power people. After spending $55 million on research and over a decade of study, they built themselves a fairly large pilot plant. The plant proved to be totally unmanageable and the project was terminated and the pilot plant is rusting away at an Ottawa landfill. We also visited a plasma arc installation in Japan where they had installed two identical plasma arc process lines to convert the bottom ash to a marketable product. The two lines were necessary in order to keep the main plant operating due to ongoing mechanical problems with the plasma arc equipment. So this rules out plasma arc. Now the construction of landfills is to be ruled out on the study because it violates four fundamental principles of waste management. One, it does not protect human health and the environment. Two, it creates a 200 year financial burden for future generations. And three, it fails to conserve waste, which is a valuable renewable resource. And fourth, it fails to retain the 24 benefits that are provided by energy from waste technology. And we have recently prepared a listing of these 24 benefits that have been uh, given to the city council and they have a detailed benefits that come from mass burn. And there's 24 of them and I'm not gonna take up your time to list them all, but I've mentioned two or three. For example, the current cost of maintaining the landfills in our project, which is a five county project, is $26 million a year. And secondly, we're running Bensford in a heavy deficit situation. And we don't have an energy from waste plant that would be generating five or $6 million of net profit every year. These are the mistakes we made 20 years ago. 
when we were promoting energy from waste. So that's about all I'd like to remind you of this evening is that we have to lift our thinking into the long term because this kind of technology doesn't get doesn't just happen overnight. It takes a, a number of years to develop. And we have our group have been working on the project for 20 for 20 years practically. And we have a tremendous amount of knowledge stored up in our members. And we had a, a lot to say about the technical approval of the Clarion, beautiful Clarion plant. And as a matter of fact, I was invited to be a guest speaker at the final evening when the Clarendon plant was approved. And if anybody would like to get copies of what I had to say here this evening, you can reach me on, a, on my email. I can give it to you if you want to write it down or you can ask Henry Clark for, for it. It's a small ed dot McClellan, M-C-L-E-L-L-A-N at cogico.ca. And I will be very happy to send you pop copies of the comments that I've made. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. McClellan, uh, your, for your, your information there. And, and I recognize too, you, you prov provided that to our recent site liaison committee meeting, which we have captured and, and, and they have that information too. Uh, I'll tell you, if I do my job right with uh, in the diversion um, and the circular economy, hoping there isn't anything left that has to go to uh, EFW or landfill or anywhere. So, um, so thanks again. Um, but again, this focus is really on keeping these materials out of any downstream uh, disposal uh, scenario, be it EFW or landfill. Alyssa, you can proceed. Sorry, I had started talking, but I was muted. Um, okay, um, next question I've got here is about um, multi-laminate plastics. Can we look at advanced recycling technology? Sherry, can you tell uh, the group what, what do we mean by that? And can we look at advanced technology for those? Absolutely. Uh, one of my pet projects, um, I've spent the last 10 years um, doing trials on capturing and sorting and reprocessing uh, laminates with uh, different end markets. Um, there's a lot of work that's been done on this in the last 10 years and more work uh, to be done. So as some of you might know, um, the brand owners or as they're called producers, industry is taking over the blue box recycling program across Ontario um, starting the transition in 2023 and then, you know, 33% roughly of municipalities will transition over for a three-year period. Um, and after 2026, the, the brand owners will be running the program. Um, they will be managing it. They'll be running it. They'll be responsible for all the costs and for managing all the materials in it. And that includes the uh, multi-layer plastic laminates. So the brand owners will have to take this packaging, they'll have to accept it, they'll have to sort it out, and they are going to have to find end market solutions for it. So this will be their responsibility. And as they're collecting larger volumes of it, they will have economies of scale. Um, they'll have more, much more of that material from across Ontario, and they will be able to create end markets for it. Um, as has been noted, uh, advanced recycling versus mechanical recycling. Um, just a quick explanation. Mechanical recy recycling is very much like it sounds. Um, things are shredded, broken apart, uh, melted, you know, different kinds of processes that are strictly mechanical. Um, advanced recycling is also called chemical recycling, which is where plastics are actually broken down to their original, what is called a monomer, their original pulled apart from, so if you've got three different layers of plastic melted together, instead of trying to separate the layers mechanically, it is all melted down and separated through technology um, to its different chemical forms. <laughs> and I am not a chemist. Mike can jump in at any time because he's way better at that stuff than I am. Um, that is definitely something that is, is being looked at. Um, there are some facilities that are taking laminates and doing that kind of work with it. The issue is the economy of scale and having large enough volumes and 
every pouch that you see has a slightly different makeup. So there is a huge amount of work um, being done, actually, um, interestingly enough, by a lot of the oil companies. They're branching off and creating um, advanced recycling facilities across North America as they spin off, as we get less dependent on oil with electric vehicles and that sort of thing. Won't take us down that road, but the oil companies are actually investing hundreds of millions of dollars into that technology. So as far as Peterborough goes, uh, as the recycling program transitions, transitions over to industry responsibility, that packaging will be their responsibility. They will have to accept it in the program. This is in a couple of years. Um, you'll obviously be getting lots of notice on, on that sort of thing when those, that packaging is accepted. And then they will have to find um, a closed loop system to manage that. Does that help? I think that helps. Um, okay, I, Sherry, stay with us. I've got a question about clear bags. So um, will there be any consideration for those who may have more waste than what would fit in a grocery bag or kitchen catcher that they may want to dispose of privately? Will there be a way of obtaining an exem exemption, thinking of people who might suffer from a medical related issue as an example? Uh, I okay yeah go ahead Dave. Yeah yeah certainly medical exemption issues are a consideration and I know there are some programs that I've seen in Colchester, Nova Scotia and other locations as well where they do have medical exemption uh, small containers for for those that need it. I think on a case by case uh, study we can we can assess that as well but uh, with regards to the amount of material generated in a, in a household um, I think we would all be amazed at how much of the material generated regardless of whether it's one, two, four or five individuals um, is truly the garbage material. The privacy bag, I guess my, my rule would be if it's, if it's truly garbage, whatever it is, put, put it into the, to that clear bag is garbage. Um, and uh, in some jurisdictions, they do not have bag limits because if it's truly garbage, they can put it out as garbage and, and in the small privacy bag, one, two or three inside can, can hide the uh, contents of, of materials that people wish for that to be so. But as I mentioned earlier, the reality is that the clear bags help to push the needle extensively on diverting the true divertible materials out of that waste stream. And 75% and is definitely a target that can be accomplished. Okay, thanks Dave. That's great, um, great input with regards to the medical. We will take that into consideration as we, as we move forward as well, for sure. Okay, I'm just uh, uh, scrolling back through. I know there was some that I had jumped over. Um, okay, I think, I think I can kind of push these into one question. There's a, there's a few that are maybe um, suggestions of what about this or what about that? So I'm just gonna throw them out there and Dave or Sherry, if you, if you have any talking points about any of these things, just jump in. So um, one was a deposit for bottles, the banning of plastic bags in stores. Um, oh, let me just scroll and read. While you're scrolling. Yeah, go ahead. Those. For sure, deposit return is an excellent way to have those materials, whether it's, it's uh, beer bottles or, or uh, beer cans, et cetera, going back to the, uh, uh, to the retailer. I would challenge is 10 cents enough of an incentive to encourage everybody to do so. I think that 10 cents has been in place for believe at least 10 years and Mikey could correct me here but you know I think if that were increased that would absolutely help on the deposit the return banning uh banning materials um as some of you or all of you may know at the federal level there is a focus on banning hard to recycle plastics and within the city of Peterborough a couple of years ago uh, and we have him on our line the line here as well Councillor Gary Baldwin chaired our um, single-use plastic uh, advisory committee where we were looking at a lot of these quote hard to recycle 
uh, materials and, and actions to get them out of the streams. COVID has put a little bit of a delay on our initiatives there, but at the same time, the federal government is proceeding with um, legislation at a, at a very high level to ban a lot of these items to begin with. Uh, because at the end of the day, we're a municipality that has to deal with what's being produced by the great big world out there and the retailers and such that are that are producing this and, and their focus is uh, provincial wide or national. So we need that top down legislation to help us with that, to look at some of these items that can just disappear. Hopefully I address those two. Um, just to jump in, Dave, on the deposit return, just wanted to clarify, deposit return systems are set up provincially. They're not um, ever done at a municipal level. The infrastructure required to set up uh, an extensive deposit return, I think, for bottles that are other than, if you're speaking to things that are other than the uh, beer, wine, and spirits that we have in Ontario, because I think some provinces have a more extensive deposit return program than we do, um, it has to be done at a provincial level to be able to set that up. There have been studies done um, to determine whether provinces that currently don't have everything, like Ontario, should set it up and the, you know, those studies determined that they feel they can capture enough through the uh, blue box program that they don't need to add that because the infrastructure cost is massive uh, to set up deposit return. So kind of where we're already at with the recycling system, uh, that, that was decided by the province uh, several years back not to look at uh, adding anything other than beer, wine and spirits. I don't know, Mike, if you have anything to add on that particular one. I think you've covered it well, Sherry, so that's great. Okay, um, uh, we've got one question here about backyard composting, basically. I'll, I'll try not to, well, I'll read it out, but I, I think I can um, rephrase what they're trying to get at. So it says, I plow diversion of green waste away from landfill, but why is there no plan to build the existing personal composting part of the other stream? It's lower impact to handle it on site than doing pickup and large volume management. Single family residents have space to allow them to change behavior and divert at home. Seems like public education is already part of the COP waste management. Can you encourage yard and kitchen waste to be handled at home? And of course, we know this is already happening. I think, um, what the question is, is it does that get captured in the data currently that that some people are composting their food waste at home? And um, what is the city doing to encourage that behavior? I can jump in here. Um, yeah. and, yes, and, and, and whoever raised that question, very good point, because whatever is dealt with at home is not in the system that we have to manage at all. So, so it's wonderful. So yes, we as a city do offer subsidized backyard composters available through the city, through uh, uh, Green Up as well, and through our recycling facility for people if they like to purchase them and use them. Um, I guess avid gardeners would say, you don't even need a plastic one, you can just make it. You can just put a pile of it back and put some cinder blocks around it covered up and, and as long as you're generating the heat, you're creating a composter and absolutely that works well. So the intent is to certainly continue to, uh, uh, to encourage residents to do backyard composting programs should they wish. As I mentioned, we do offer them and have for years. Um, there is, there does tend to be a real correlation between gardeners and backyard composters. And what studies have shown is that when a curbside collection program is offered, um, across the board, a lot of people will use that as their standard uh, downstream for their material. Uh, a backyard composter, certainly you can put your food material in there, but there are limitations. You don't put meat into that. You don't, you don't put uh, bones. Um, and so, so you're gonna have to find a, a, a downstream for that anyway. But if, if people are participating now in backyard composting and want to, great. Um, the yard waste, you know, the leaves that you generate in the fall are a great carbon source. You've got to make a carbon nitrogen ratio for your compost. So that works great. Uh, I've been involved in programs where we partnered with Toro to try to encourage people to transition their lawnmowers to mulchers so that the grass is simply cut and left on the lawn as a natural fertilizer as opposed to raked, uh, you know, because a lot of people think they need a golf course uh, lawn and you know that's not true but 
um, by all means, um, mulching and backyard composting uh, is, is a very, very uh, important tool that residents can participate in. It's not as easy in a multi-res building. You could look into getting a vermin bin system with worms and bins, but it's a little more maintenance with that. Uh, or maybe your property manager can put a, um, something on site down uh, in their garden area, their outdoor area, but um, that's really an individual basis. That's it. Okay, thanks Dave. Um, we've got a couple questions here for Sherry. Um, this one references a CBC radio story of dirty plastics from Canada being burned in, in India. Um, how much blue box material is contaminated and gets redirected to landfill? Um, I think, oh, sorry, go ahead, Dick. Sherry, I, I know you can comment more on a, a provincial or national level. I'll comment on our city-specific program. Um, as, as I think a lot of residents know, we have a very, very um, strict policy at, at the curb as far as having the material diverted properly into the two streams. And that's because we absolutely want to ensure that we are creating a material that has a downstream market. There's a saying, garbage in, garbage out. We have been very, very good at ensuring that um, what our collectors are collecting uh, for the most part is recycled. Uh, we do have some challenges say with our 24 seven depot that's not supervised all the time that we might get some materials in there, but we are running with a contamination rate that is below 13% um, below of everything that we recycle would actually end up being that material that just gets mixed in that we can't address. So Sherry, I'll let you talk maybe, and I've seen the CBC show as well, and we're all aware of the China, the green sword, et cetera. So you may want to mention why, what, what situations were occurring that caused a lot of this contaminated material to be shipped overseas? Yes. Yeah, so as someone who's been in this industry 32 years now, and, you know, I used to, I spent 13 years at the city's recycling facility, marketing the materials to different end markets. And then I switched to the other side where I actually work with end markets and help supply them with material. It's not to say that that didn't happen. Clearly it happened. Um, from experience and specifically, most especially with the Peterborough facility, we determine where our material goes. We don't just take it and grab any old buyer and, and ship it off. We know the end market our material is going to go to. And for the most part, for most materials, um, Peterborough has and, and most of the Ontario recycling facilities, especially municipally operated and, and, and owned ones, they try to keep it all in North America. There are some materials that the markets are far bigger outside of North America. For instance, China uses massive amounts of cardboard, um, absolutely monstrous amounts. They require that ends up getting shipped back to North America as different products. But so that's not to say things aren't shipped off. Some unscrupulous facilities were creating loads of material and shipping them wherever they could, um, putting it in sea containers, stuff was going. And, you know, uh, that unfortunately, I think it's the nature of almost every business, there's unscrupulous facilities and businesses. Um, from the Peterborough facility and the other municipal facilities, I can tell you these materials go to end markets. As I said, the company that I consult with, the other half of it is marketing, and that is what we do all day, every day. We visit the facilities, we work with the facility owners, we know where these bales of material are going, we know what they do with it. Um, as I mentioned, there's always some yield loss and a bit of contamination that comes off the end, but they're not ending up on a beach somewhere. Um, in, a, in a foreign country to be dealt with by, that, that's just not what's happening with it. So um, I'm happy to address offline any questions. Um, city staff have my uh, contact info if anybody wants to know a little bit more about where specific commodities go and what happens with it, I'm happy to address that offline. Okay, um, I think we're getting close to the end. I see a couple of really great suggestions. Um, one for advanced recycling technology, like biochemical depo can I pronounce this? Depolymerization. Um, and another one for a city run repair cafe. Maybe now's just a good time to say thanks for sending in your suggestions and we will capture these um, and and 
when you're doing the survey later on, if there's any other ideas you have, please submit them there. Sherry, Dave, do you want to speak to that advanced recycling technology that I can't pronounce or the repair cafe at all? Yeah, Alyssa, I'll, I'd like to speak to the repair uh, cafe. And I am a very, very strong proponent of where you can, you work locally. So we do have, Peterborough is, is a very, very green community and we have a lot of really, really fantastic uh, stories um, of, of, of initiatives. Green Up is a fantastic uh, organization as well. We have Habitat for Humanity and others. And I, I am in dialogue with those organizations and we work closely with them um, to absolutely see what we can do to help them to, to uh, maximize diverting their material, like getting some of the reusable materials, getting it back into the, the community. Uh, we have our, our university and our college. So we have students that, that um, uh, migrate out in the spring and uh, may have materials, items they no longer need, but we have a fresh crop of students coming in in the fall that do. So to be able to close the loop with those types of things with, um, you know, whether it's tables, desks, things like that, that people can use. Absolutely. So I, I am very, very passionate towards engaging with the local organizations that, that do that kind of work. Thank you. Okay, and then flipping on to the depolymerization, that's where I go back to that advanced or chemical recycling and that is something that uh, end markets reprocessors are working on. As I said, the um, actually very large oil companies across North America are investing millions and millions of dollars into developing these facilities um, to deal with the difficult to recycle plastics. So it is happening. Um, and as uh, the industry takes over dealing with the recycling and the responsibility of it, you'll see some material that cannot be mechanically sorted, dealt with in that manner, if that helps. Okay. And Sherry, um, one more question. Do the drivers put the whole bag of shredded paper in the truck or dump then put bags separate area of the unit? So when we're talking about shredded paper, uh, that is, and, and Dave mentioned earlier that if it's shredded paper, because it's so tiny and it flies everywhere, that that, that shredded paper bag should be tied it is put in the truck, tied and left in the bag. And it will literally go into the baler with the other paper in that manner, because otherwise it'd be all over the facility and would make a huge mess. So thanks for that question, Rodney. Okay. Um, I think I'm so sorry if I have missed any big ones through here, um, scrolling through, but I, there's one last one just about, is there um, a a video or other resources on the city website that explains about proper recycling? Um, we, we actually just worked with a Trent University student who was uh, putting together a video and we did have one on the landfill side that was produced to help and they showed it at their um, at the university and their sustainability class. Uh, we, we have had interest in and doing the same with our recycling facility. And I should add that when our new contractor, Terra Environmental, who is our collection and processing contractor, and I know there are some individuals here on, on the call now too, um, when they took over the contract in the fall of 2019, our recycling facility, basically it was, all of the old equipment was taken out and every the floors were reinforced, the walls, and we had brand new state-of-the-art, it's Machine X technology, it's a two-stream system. It's probably $10 million infrastructure put into that facility, uh, including optic eyes, which will target specific plastics and use air streams to shoot them, and a uh, magnet for the steel and an uh, eddy current to, to snag the aluminum, et cetera. It's pretty wild. Um, and we are, we've, our staff and I, we've just uh, finished having signage put into the facility because it can be very confusing. And we are looking to create a video that we could provide uh, online. And I think whoever asked that um, good question and, and we are focused on that because we have a really, really, really good story 
to tell to the general public out there on that. On our website, we, we do have um, pretty elaborate streaming guides. We have the calendar, as Sherry mentioned, in, in our calendar that is distributed in, in December um, the year prior, uh, has a lot of information on what to do. We have staff that are fully available and accessible for questions. We have a fantastic communication section with um, um, with with feedback um, if people have inquiries so a video by all means we could uh, we're certainly interested in proceeding and I think to tie that in once we have the organics facility up and running to have a comprehensive video makes an awful lot of sense so we can really share our story but um, we definitely want to get the information out to all of you and and because we're very proud of it Very cool. Okay, I'm going to suggest that we move on at this point and talk about next steps of the project. Um, if I missed any questions as we were going through that, I, again, I am sorry, but you will have an opportunity to uh, send more of your feedback in the survey, as I mentioned before, and as well, we'll be capturing the questions that we received through this chat. So we'll, we'll have that opportunity to address them later. So on the next steps, and I know that the next slide that uh, is going to come up is going to provide you with information where to provide your feedback to us. And we really, really encourage you to please provide it. And we want you to be brutally honest with us too. Tell us what you really want. Tell us what you're passionate about. Tell us if you're interested and in, tell us what you would do in that because we, we are focused on taking uh, the best of the best that we've learned over our careers in this industry at other municipalities, I like to call it, we're almost like the second most of the mousetrap. And we want to take those, steal those jewels of success from elsewhere and bring it all home here in Peterborough. So we will be taking this information that's been shared tonight, the questions, we'll be uh, tabulating that, we'll be going internally, we'll be doing more uh, uh, assessment in depth to rolling out these programs and we will be following up with a second um, public um, consultation, whether it's virtual or, or whether we can hold it in person, I guess uh, uh, time will tell as, as, we, as we work through this pandemic. But the intent then will be to pull it all together with a comprehensive report, we take back to our council, we get endorsement to proceed and we start rolling these programs out. Okay, um, Sherry, did you want to say anything on this slide? You're still muted. Well, there we go. Um, hey. No, that's <laughs> no. I think Dave covered it all. Uh, that's. Okay. I, I just want to really encourage people. As I said, you'll you'll talk to them about how to get at this online form, and please provide the information. Share it with your friends. So that we can get, you know, I mean, we had a great response of people on this call, but clearly it wasn't the whole city. So please share it with your friends and they'll all stop. <laughs> Alyssa, you can advance. There you go. That's yeah, we'll go here. And actually, what I'll maybe do if I'm slick enough is I can share my screen and show um, the actual Connect Peter Bro. So right here you see the link connectptbo.ca slash waste plan 2022. Um, so that is where basically everything to do with this project is gonna be living. And I'm just gonna go to that web page right now and I'll show you where the, you can find the survey. So um, this is what the landing page looks like. Tomorrow on this page, you will see a recording of tonight's meeting as well as the slideshow. So if you wanna share it with anyone, you can do so that way. Um, and right now, if you scroll down to the bottom, you can see under this blue bar feedback form and this blue button says complete form. So that's where you find this, the feedback form with the questions and when, where we're looking for feedback from everyone. So there's, there's also, if you can't get to here, there's also an email address. We'll go back to the slide. Uh, wasteplan2022 at peterborough.ca. You can just email us and we'll be collecting all the feedback through that. And there's also a voicemail. So it's the, the number at the city, 
1-800-273-7777. And extension 1724 will bring you to a voicemail box. And I don't know if there's a time limit, but you can go on and on and, and we'll get that recording and capture it into the feedback that we've received for this project. Um, and that, yeah, the only other thing to mention, as, as Dave said before, there'll be a second meeting coming up. Um, so just watch all the usual channels for more information about that. Well, in closing from the city, we thank all of you for participating and wish, we wish you all a fantastic rest of the evening. So thank you very much. Thank you.